Okay, that should be hopefully recording. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. Today, I want you to do a little bit of multitasking, which you've done in the past a bit, uh, as I put up some slides with quotations to try and read them while you're listening, that might save a bit of time. Um, as I said, I'm going to be looking at, in two sections, really the age of reform and the second half on what, to, to use J.S. Mill's title, the subjection of women. Historians have termed the 19th century the age of reform. And indeed, it was political. It was indeed that political administrative reform was accompanied by economic and social and public health reforms that we looked at in an earlier talk. Eighteen thirty <coughs> proved, I beg your pardon, uh, was a turbulent and um, tumultuous year. In France, King Charles V was over Charles the Tenth was overthrown in the July Revolution and replaced by the much more moderate and constitutional Louis Philippe, Duke d'Orléans. The revolution in Tricolor re-established by the Marquis de Lafayette, once more flew over Paris. The young John Henry Newman, sorry, just let me clear my throat. <coughs> I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. The young John Henry Newman did not dare to leave his hotel on foot for fear of walking under its shadow. The August August, the August Revolution in Belgium saw the removal of the Dutch from what became Belgium and the establishment of a new independent kingdom, ruled over by the future Queen Victoria's uncle Leopold. In Britain, the swing riots broke out and the reform crisis began as Wellington's government entered its final days. The death of Louis, uh, sorry, the death of George IV on the 26th of June and his succession by his brother as William IV necessitated under the constitution as it then was a general election. The result of that election weakened Wellington's government and strengthened the hands of his reforming opponents. Wellington had needed substantial gains, which did not materialize. Nevertheless, the Iron Duke's speech in the House of Lords on the 2nd of November was intransigent and itself precipitated the downfall of the Tory government. Do have a look at those words. You can see he has full faith in the unreformed constitution the old constitution and sees no reason for changing it. It has to be said the Duke of Wellington ran government like he was running a military campaign and he ordered his cabinet, who on the whole didn't like getting orders, they liked to be um, consulted. The new Whig government under the second Earl Grey, whom you, some of you might know as the one for whom Twinings um, brewed the famous tea, uh, was committed to parliamentary reform. And that case was a strong one. They claimed that the current reform crisis raised the spectre of revolution. And there were manifestly large levels of what was termed old corruption. The new emerging middle class, the new emerging middle classes, constituted a new form of property, as yet unrepresented. The newly industrialized and expanding towns had either no or insufficient parliamentary seats, as compared with many rural ones 
that returned members. And finally, the new reform bill would settle the issue for at least a generation, so it came. The new bill concentrated on the two issues of the redistribution of seats, which rather confusingly is referred to as enfranchisement, and the extension of the vote. Lord John Russell proposed the bill in the House of Commons. And the words are in front of you. The Tory government in the Commons was led by Sir Robert Peel. He argued that the checks and balances in the Constitution would be destroyed, as the King would no longer be able to exercise his prerogative over the House of Commons, nor make any changes, make changes in the Ministry. He asked in a rather um, uh, prophetic words, really, um, when you have once established the overpowering influence of the people over this house, that's the House of Commons, what other authority in the state can, nay, what other authority in the state ought to control its will or reject its decision. He challenged the government's claim that to the bill's finality and warned a government which would unsettle the minds of the people on this subject would be responsible for the consequences that must result. The general election of 1831 resulted in a large majority in favour of reform. The second bill passed the House of Commons in September. It was repeated it was defeated by 199 votes to 158. The news being uh, in the Lords, the news being greeted by widespread riots in the country, particularly in Bristol, Derby, and Nottingham, with some loss of life. The third Home Rule Bill finally received the royal assent on the 7th of June, 1832. The first home, the first, or what has gone down in some historical terms as the Great Reform Act, uh, set the template for the second and ultimately for the third Reform Act. As it, um, in that it encompassed both the redistribution of seats and the extension of the vote. Furthermore, it required all electors to register, as they still do, and created for the first time an exclusively male electorate for the next 86 years. The constitutional historian whom I referred to in an earlier talk, A.B. Dicey, looked beyond the form and practical consequences of the Reform Act and pointed out that it did have one almost revolutionary quality. It altered the way in which people, he wrote, it altered the way in which people thought of the Constitution and taught Englishmen that venerable institutions which custom had made unchangeable could easily and without the use of violence be changed. Lord, the second Reform Act we're coming up to now, Lord John Russell brought in unsuccessful reform bills in 1852 and 1854. In 1858, a bill to remove quality qualifications for MPs was one of the demands, which was one of the demands of the Chartists, was passed without any controversy under the short the lived minority conservative government. In the same year, Disraeli suggested that reform could be the necessary means to revive conservative fortunes. He pointed out that the act had uh, actually served 
their interests, leading to the conclusion. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, yes, Palmerston uh, uh, to come afterwards. I'm sorry. Um, the conclusion uh, that a further act may actually increase their popularity. I'll push that back to Palmerston in a moment. Um, the failure of that 1839 Act led to the fall of Derby's second minority government. And Russell brought in a further unsuccessful bill in 1860. In reality, all attempts at parliamentary reform seemed doomed while Palmerston was alive and at the helm, as he as Prime Minister for most of the decades, decade between 1855 and 1865. Palmerston said his views very clearly in opposing Russell's Bill of 1854. The direct consequence, well, please read it, by the way, yep, if you can. Oh, sorry, my fault. Sorry, preemptive strike. Yep. Um, However, when he died in, on the 18th of October, 1865, two days before his 81st birthday, he was replaced by Lord John Russell. As the historian Eric Evans wrote, one old man, notably averse to parliamentary reform, was replaced by another with a boyish enthusiasm for it. By the early 1840s and 60s, however, there was a growing momentum for a, me a further measure of parliamentary reform. The new model unions of the 1850s that I looked at again in a previous talk had given a respectable face to the trade unionism of skilled workers. They favored negotiations to confrontation encouraged their numbers to start saving, dissociated themselves from violence, sought to emulate what were regarded as middle-class values, encouraging thrift, self-improvement, and opportunism to receive education. Karl Marx stated, in England, prolonged prosperity has demoralized the workers the revolutionary element of the British workers has oozed away. They totally lack the metal of the old Chartists. Friedrich Engels, then in exile in, in Manchester, put it even more succinctly. The English proletariat's revolutionary energy has completely evaporated. What disheartened Marx and Engels had the opposite effect on Palmerston's ch Chancellor of the Exchequer, William Ewart Gladstone, in a speech on the, on the 11th of May, 1864. Please do have a look at it. This is known as the pale of the constitution speech because of a phrase in the second paragraph. He and Russell were ready to introduce a new reform bill in March, 1866. But this bill met with serious opposition from within their own party. The modest reform bill was defeated by a combination of conservatives, conservatives and conservative Whig opposition led by, when you're ready, I'll bring on to the next one, Robert Lowe. Uh, Robert Lowe, a famous albino incidentally, um, and uh, I think you can read this because Robert Lowe led a very strong opposition from, he was part of the government, he actually resigned from the cabinet 
as well um, as did um, so one to others, but he was a prominent figure in the weak part. But I should point out the what had happened um, in the mid. I, I will do. I want to do some series on parliamentary parties after this at some point. Um, the Conservative Party had completely broken up uh, after the fall of Peel, when Peel's brought in uh, the repeal of the Corn Laws. Uh, uh, the Conservative Party um, split into two groups. And one group, those who supported Peel, went off and finally merged with the Whigs, uh, the, uh, the, opposition, uh, the, the opposition party of the Tories, and the Radicals to form the Liberal Party in 1859. And of course, uh, one of the prominent ones of these Peelite groups were, was Gladstone. Uh, who ultimately came to lead that party in 18, uh, 18, oh, thank you, uh, 1859, sorry, 186, sorry, not 1859, 1868. Once in government, Albeit in a minority, Disraeli seized on reform to win over the artisan vote uh, to, the, to the Conservatives. Lord Derby as Prime Minister and Disraeli as Chancellor saw the sponsorship of reform as an expedient gesture to keep the administration going and crack the Liberals by dishing the Whigs. In November 1866, they persuaded the cabinet to agree on this. The bill was introduced and underwent many amendments. Uh, each, it seemed, more daring and more radical than the last one. Disraeli waved them through each amendment in his own desire to undermine and infuriate Gladstone, which he did. He closed such changes in the tradition of Edmund Burke in the um, sentences that you can see before you. Passing through the Commons, it went up to the Lords, where Lord Derby, as Prime Minister, sought to reassure their Lordships on the Third Amendment. In the passage that you can read this famous speech of his, which became um, uh, well known because of the phrase, a leap in the dark, and Punch magazine caught on with this, Britannia, being rushed, um, hell for leather, um, in the air, uh, direction of reform with Lord Derby's face on the front of it. Uh, and the rest of the government trying to keep up in the background. Um, uh, John Tenniel, of course, famous for his illustrations of Alice in Wonderland. The Secret Reform Act added one million 100,000 voters to the previous 1,400,000. The total electorate in England and Wales was now 2.5 million out of a population of 22.5 million. One in three adult males, men, could vote, whereas previously it had been one in five. Meanwhile, seats were reallocated again, many to the new towns, thus continuing the work that had been started by the first Reform Act. Gladstone's administration, um, Gladstone's reform. The secret ballot had been one of the demands of the Chartists and had received mounting support in the 1860s. Gladstone's first administration brought it in. The 1873 Act 
stipulated that electors were to vote secretly by marking a cross on a printed ballot paper and then place it in a sealed box. Polling booths were to be set up in each constituency. Furthermore, votes were to be counted in the presence of candidates and agents. Thus, in his second administration, the Corrupt and Illegal Practices Act received the royal assent. It introduced election agents responsible for all aspects of an election campaign and made it possible for the elimination of bribery, at least in the crudest form, by making it a criminal offence. The loophole was that the fi fixed limit on, on expenditure applied only to individual constituencies and not to the overall expenditure of political parties, often funded by the substantial donations of those with a keen interest in the outcome. Gladstone's third, this is a, a cartoon rigging actually to his first administration that's made the great, which that ties in with Bright's um, comments earlier. <clears throat> Gladstone's third reform act went almost all the way to universal male suffrage and introduced a uniform franchise for the whole of the United Kingdom. It enabled the majority of adult males to vote. 15.6% of the total population, an increase of 67%. The main exceptions were domestic servants, resident with their employees, employers, and persons in receipt of poor relief. It had only passed through the Lords when Gladstone bowed to Salisbury's insistence that it be accompanied <coughs> by a redistribution act, which was passed the following year. Ironically, through this act, it was Salisbury who brought about one of the demands of the People's Charter, the Chartists for equal constituencies. One short line.